Howdy y'all, grab yourselves a beer, it's time to talk Path of Exile. I've called this video my Autopsy of the Betrayal League. Now, obviously you can't carry out an autopsy on something until it's dead, but I realised after barely logging into the game this week that my passion for this league is basically gone. In terms of other anecdotal metrics, uh, I haven't done any real research on it, but it looks like the Path of Exile Reddit has gotten a lot quieter than usual, even for this time of the league. And there's less content creator videos than at this time in Delve. And that this comes after the explosive um, growth in Path of Exile that happened as a result of the whole Diablo Immortal sh um, debacle that led to a lot of people churning across from Diablo 3, giving Path of Exile a go. So Betrayal had the biggest uh, start of league of any league in the game's history by far. And now people have largely seemed, or seem to be losing interest faster than they did in Delve. And even, uh, as far as I recall, faster than they did in Abyss or some of the other leagues that didn't have as much late league push as Delve did. Now, I wanted to try to look at why I think this is. The closest comparison that I can make to the Betrayal League is actually the Dark Shrine League, which was a one-month silly league, maybe about three years ago, that had absurd loot and absurd events that were gated behind um, puzzles of a sort. Dark Shrine was great fun as a one-month hiatus from the normal rules of the game, but broke badly once it became solved, and once players learnt how to abuse the Dark Shrine mechanic. Uh, so if you're familiar with the Labyrinth, uh, Eternal Labyrinth Dark Shrines, Dark Shrines look like that, but they function differently. You would sacrifice a rare item to them. Uh, the game would pick one of the mods on that rare item at random, and then would generate some effect that would uh, affect your character or the entire zone based upon the rare mod that was selected. And if my memory recalls, because it's quite hard to find this information, I believe that players uh, solved the puzzle of what to do with the Dark Shrines when they recognised that the best thing to sacrifice was jewels, and you wanted specifically a rare jewel that had the mod uh, your mines have increased, I can't remember whether it was Critical Strike or Crit Multiplier, and this did absurd things to the zone. Um, one, one of the powerful options would force massive amounts of mortal fragments to drop in the zone, uh, and another one would first would double the number of magic monsters on the map, but this could stack multiple times. And so you could, if you stack this multiple times, you can get quadrupled size, pack size for uh, magic monsters, or even octuple with a bit of luck. Now, as I say, Dark Shrine was a lot of fun until it was solved, but once players solved the puzzle, it got old fast. I loved weeks one and two of that league, and I don't think I even played in week four at all. I think Betrayal's been very similar, and I don't think that the Betrayal content is fit for the core game in its present state. Everything in there is salvageable, um, but I want to also look at some of the changes that took place at the same time as the Betrayal League, because Betrayal League stayed fun for longer than I think the actual Betrayal mechanics themselves um, deserved to, and that was because of some of the uh, great other changes that were made. So I'll look at those other changes first, and then I'll return to the Betrayal-specific content, the Syndicate Encounters, uh, the Mastermind, and the, and the Research Houses later. One final point, in this video I'll be using the term strictly dominant occasionally. Uh, it's a game theory term which refers to any strategy that, just from a rewards and a risk and rewards perspective, awards more loot, more XP, at less risk than another strategy. So if strategy A strictly dominates strategy B, that, me uh, that means that at least I'm claiming that strategy A provides more of every relevant type of reward in the game at lower risk. And you have a real problem in a game when strategy A strictly dominates strategy B, but players intrinsically find engaging with strategy B more fun. I think that becomes a game design crisis, and that is what's been happening in the Betrayal League. So firstly, uh, just having a look at the challenges, which has been one of the controversies going around, uh, I think there's been a bad mixture of easy challenges that have been very grindy. The two most extreme challenges the only two that seem out of reach for me, and that um, I think that the largest percentage of the player base will fail to achieve, are not particularly difficult, they're just grindy. This is, of course, the, as I'll just uh, jump into the game client at this point, and 
demonstrate the um, challenges that I'm referring to, there is the end game grinds challenge, which is just about doing medium to difficult content very, very, very large numbers of times. So completing end game grinds is to basically pick four. Uh, complete your syndicate safe houses, uh, open chests at the end of the endgame labyrinth, reach level 100, reach 600 in your mine, or uh, kill 60 high level Omnitex or kill 40 bestiary bosses. This is a very doable in uh, very doable endgame grind. It's probably one of the easiest ones that we've had. Uh, if you drop the first two, so you get... Oh, well, actually, if you do whichever you prefer... Level 100 is easier in this league than it has been in previous ones. Um, so... If you were to push level 100 via breach stone rotations, if you were to push um, the Omnitect via trading with other players in order to get access to their temples of Atsuatl, uh, which is something I haven't been doing, I've just run 11 naturally that I've naturally encountered. Uh, if you kill bestiary bosses in rotations or by buying the common one, the bird, and if you run a whole bunch of safe houses, all of that is very doable if you're a dedicated and skilled player. Uh, the other one that it seems out of reach for me is, and but again, this is the one that's had the most complaints about it, is completing Atlas objectives. This is, again, it's very doable. If I'd, been, if I'd had my mind set to it, I would have, um, would have achieved this by the end of the league. In fact, this is the first one that I, that I felt getting 40 out of 40 challenges was really achievable for me. Um, I just didn't decide to do it. But um, this challenge is not particularly difficult. It is just extraordinarily grindy. And that's one of the things that I don't like about this league uh, that's separate from the actual betrayal mechanics. Um, the most mechanically challenging of the um, challenges is probably actually some of the map boss hard mode ones, uh, like clearing the primordial blocks high lithomancer boss without being hit by the rolling boulders. That's not a very difficult, in very difficult encounter, but it's probably the most difficult of the ones that are on the challenges list. Uh, another thing with the challenges, the Elva implementation is troublesome. Um, and I think the workarounds are extremely unsatisfying. 11 incursions per temple was the right number in the incursion league, uh, but it's no longer so right now. And this relates to one of the challenges, uh, the challenge that's related to Elva, which is to uh, fully upgrade all 24 Temple of Atsuatl rooms. Again, I could achieve this if I wanted to. Uh, it would entail simply uh, joining other players that manage to get lucky and get Throne of Atsuri room. Um, I got lucky myself and got the Atlas of Worlds room um, on my own Atlas and sold it to a couple of players while I was at it. But um, this challenge wasn't too unreasonable in the Incursion League. But since the Incursion League has, uh, since the Incursion content has entered the core game, it's become more unreasonable than it, than it was then. In any case, I will end up getting 36 of 40 before the end of the league. That won't be hard, and I think I'm very, very close to it at the moment. It's just a matter of laziness and lacking the, ins the inspiration to uh, continue playing. So that's my wrap-up of the challenges. I think they've been too easy and too grindy at the same time. Some sorts of things I'd like to see in the future there. Uh, I'd like to see something like uh, complete 30 tier 16 maps that are 8 mod rares. That's the sort of uh, challenge that is considerably more difficult. Still easily enough done, in a, especially in group play, um, but it's something that requires players not just to do one Diffi one moderately difficult thing once, but to demonstrate consistently that they can um, that they can repeat it. Anyways, the second major change that took place was the updates to the Atlas of Worlds, and you'll notice that because I've been running on a low level character, um, my Elder Patch is currently in an area of the Atlas that is low level maps. Uh, in terms of the major changes to the Atlas, I think these have been refreshing. And the Tier 15s, although there was a lot of early concern about the Tier 15s, uh, the Tower Map's density is exceptional, Desert Springs' density is solid, Lava Lake's density is okay, and then you've got, you know, Primordial Blocks and Summit are probably the worst of the Tier 15 maps. But they're actually quite good. One problem with them is that not fighting the bosses seems to be a strictly dominant strategy. 
Um, the only one of the higher tier map bosses that seems to have a... And by higher tier, I'm not talking the tier 16 Shaper Guardians, I'm talking for other red maps, like um, like the, the natural tier 15 maps, like Tower, Desert Spring, also the tier 14s, that sort of thing. Um, not fighting the boss is a strictly dominant strategy at the moment, and I think that's bad, because it's generally uh, generally more interesting to engage bosses that have challenging mechanics. So, for that reason, I think that some of the premium divination cards, like the uh, nurse card in the tower, should actually be gated behind these bosses. Perhaps drop as often as they do now, uh, but only from the bosses. Even, even perhaps drop a little bit more than they do at the moment. Um, all of the higher tier maps, they generally have premium divination cards uh, or something semi-premium, like the Lava Lake has the card The Wrath, which is for 10, a set of 8 fo cards for 10 Chaos Orbs. This sort of thing that could drop, if it dropped only from the boss, from uh, Katava, the Destroyer, but with quite a high drop rate, like an average of 1.5 cards per, um, per map, that's the sort of thing that would be quite an incentive to actually clear the bosses. But that said, I think the Atlas changes generally were um, were refreshing. However, one major drop, uh, one major problem with them, and that was the incredible amount of um, of maps that entered the economy. And you'll see here, this isn't even all my tier 15s. I have lots of them in another tab where they're listed for sale separately. Um, you can see that I've got something like five, uh, 400 uh, red maps over. And that's just from natural play, that, uh, well, with the exception of buying a few at the start. I have sold a lot of maps. I think I've sold more than I've purchased, and I still have hundreds and hundreds of red maps. Now, that may sound like it's a good thing, in that if I want to run a red map, I can do so. However, it means that there is basically no, uh, no real cost, no real opportunity cost for me to just say, oh, I want to run a tier 14? Well, let's just pick this dark forest map, and let's just run it white, because I'm throwing away nothing of value in doing so. And then, you know, I'll go through and I'll run this map, and it will be trivial, it will be boring, my character will utterly dominate it. But I can do this, get ultra safe XP, without, um, without really any risk of ever running out of maps. Uh, in previous leagues, higher tier maps were too precious to waste in this way. Um, and you can see, look, this character's not even particularly particularly tremendously strong. Um, instead of investing uh, currency into improving this character further, I ended up putting a lot of it into purchasing a headhunter for an ult. Um, this character can't even use the headhunter to any good effect, so I'm quite a bit weaker than you would expect for, um, you know, for being on a... being, uh, having a league wealth of perhaps 65 or 70 exalted orbs. I'm using dumpster tier rings, and it's just a case of, oh look, I can just blitz through here. It's all trivial. Here's this Elva content. Yep, that's going to be trivial. And this one of the problems with the Atlas system at the moment is that um, the more maps that enter the economy, the less of a cost there is to going and running maps with no mods or with very trivial mods on them. Now, this league. I'm just going to dis deactivate that freezing shrine because it's getting quite annoying. Um, in this league, the tier 15 plus sustain point, where large numbers of players are sustaining the highest tiers of maps, was achieved just way too early in the league. There's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, there's a couple of mechanics in, in the Betrayal League that absolutely vomit out maps into the economy. Firstly, there's uh, Delve. Whilst it takes a little while to get to Deep Delves, once you do, it just absolutely dumps uh, enormous amounts of maps on you. And secondly, there's the existence of, cartogra of um, cartographer scarabs, which I'll come back to later. Scarabs in general have, um, have some problems with them. But ultimately, I think there's a more fundamental problem, and that is that the player base, I'm not saying every individual player, but I'm saying that a sizable minority of the player base has out-leveled and out-geared the Atlas content in its entirety, um, with the possible exception of some of the more challenging bosses, like the, the Four Shaper Guardians, the Four Elder Guardians, Red Elder Hard Mode, the Shaper, and the Uber Elder Encounter. The rest of the Atlas, 
which really is the core foundation of the end game, players have largely outleveled it by the time that they get to um, to the levels that they have these map or that they have these maps in large quantities. And this is really bad because the more difficult content, the content that is engaging once you get to the point that tier 16 maps are not challenging anymore, um, is all gated behind repeating parts of the atlas over and over again. So for instance, uh, you might get to a point where the tier 15 map, bosses, uh, map encounters and bosses are all easy, but you still struggle with the three delve bosses, um, Kurgle, uh, Aho, I'm not actually sure how to pronounce his name, and all. But in order to encounter these bosses, you need to return to the Atlas and gather Sulfite, and then you're able to fight them again. Uh, at least, you know, eventually you'll be able to find them again and fight them again. Uh, likewise, getting going and repeating the Uber Elder encounter requires that you do a whole lot of work to move around your... Uh, move around the position of your elder patch. Um, for me, I'd have to headshot the elder that's currently spawned and then you know, try and get him into as small an area as I can, then actually kill off all of these squares of elder influence. Then I'd be running tier 13 to 15 maps until the elder spawned again close to the Shaper's Realm. Then I'd have to uh, run maps strategically in order to push him into the Shaper's Realm. All of these things require a lot of running of Atlas content in order to get one more um, one more attempt to, at the uh, Uber Elder encounter. I'll just get my character safe so that I don't end up losing um, what small amount of XP I've got over my level to stupidity. I think that we're at a point where the Shaper and Elder items that were introduced in the, the War for the Atlas expansion are so powerful that players can now cope easily, I think, with uh, monster level 85 zones instead of uh, instead of the current cap of 83 for normal zones and 84 for boss encounters. I strongly think that the Atlas should be shifted up to entire tiers. This won't really affect casual players. Uh, they'll find that, you know, a casual player that currently finds tier 9 maps to be engaging and to push their li the limits of their play skill, they will find that tier, tier 7 will be the new tier 9 they'll still have access to a large amount of engaging, of engaging maps to run. Um, I also think that one other problem that remains with the Atlas, and this was the case before the, before the most recent changes, is that the natural tier 16 maps, to put it quite simply, they suck. They don't have enough monsters in them, and this is making it so that it is pretty close to, dom uh, to a strictly dominant strategy to prioritise an elder map over doing that. I get bored with elder maps, especially because you can only have one elder orb, and so I tend not to um, not to go for that strategy, even though I do think it is pretty much strictly dominant, even though you miss out on the uh, shape of fragments. Anyways, that's enough about the atlas for the moment. Um, I think the atlas changes overall were a positive. Uh, I want to talk quickly about something a lot worse, and that is scarabs. Scarabs are the I guess upgraded versions. I won't even bother completing this map because the maps are so cheap in this league that wasting one like this doesn't even feel bad. Um, but scarabs are fragment items that make significant modifications to a map. Kind of like a sextant except you can choose what they do. Some of them are cool. The breach scarab, the harbinger scarab, the um, I'll come back to some of these ones later. The bestiary scarabs. All of these add, add additional engaging content onto the map and I think are net positives. However, there are a couple of them that are really problematic. And these are the ones that act as major loot mod multipliers. The divination scarab. The cartography scarab. These multiply the amount of uh, loot that is found in an area. I think loot multipliers in general are bad for the game, and we're getting more and more and more of them. I think this has always been the case, actually. If you use them naively, you just go, okay, I'm just going to uh, take my Guild of Divination Scarab, and I'll just stick it on the map next map that I run that looks fun. So I'll go, oh, I like the tower that has some good divination cards in it, so why don't I pick out a, um, why don't I just pick out a random tower map and run the Guild of Divination Scarab with it. And I'm not actually going to do this because whilst I'm fine with wasting a tier 14 map, 
um, divination scarabs are quite a bit more valuable. But if they're used naively like this, just used on whatever map seems cool, they're unrewarding. For common, uh, for common loot multipliers, like uh, cartographer's chisels, there's no real decision, you just use them when they're available. Uh, but for rare ones, like your uh, scarabs, only players with a lot of in-game currency can afford to use them properly. And for everyone else, the correct call is to sell them to, to someone that has the bankroll to use them. This creates a rich-get-richer a rich economy, where basically you need a certain bankroll so that you can take the risk of using your, um, your high-end mapping consumables. These are things like the uh, Gilded Divination Scarab, the Monstrous Treasure Prophecy, and when combined with various sextant modifiers, all of these things, um, and I've got a video on this called my guide, uh, my uh, introduction to, to high investment mapping, that demonstrates how these multiplicatively stack with each other. And using all of your available loot multipliers at once is a strictly dominant strategy when compared to using them one by one. So with that in mind, um, I actually think it's time that Every, because every new loot multiplier that's added makes the other ones more of a problem, I think it's time f that the game goes through and cr starts to cull off some of these loot multipliers. Uh, the harmless small ones like chisels, sacrifice fragments, or the sextants that are part loot multiplier and part difficulty increase, these ones aren't particularly problematic on their own. But when they're combined with the medium-sized ones, like the magic find items, prophecies, mortal fragments, and the large ones, uh, like the, the uh, scarabs, the strongbox enrage sextant mod, the monstrous treasure prophecy, um, they start becoming much more of a problem. I think it's time that the game removes basically all of these loot multipliers, finds a new identity for cartographer's chisels, such as... Um, adding XP or adding more chance for the boss of the map to drop another map, and then rebalances loot accordingly. I'll also add that the Ambush Scarabs, which add strongboxes to the map, are a loot multiplier if and only if the strongbox, uh, in, the strongbox monsters are enraged and have plus 500% increased item quantity. Uh, as long as, if that mod remains, which I don't think it should, then the Ambush uh, Scarabs are also a loot multiplier. So I think that the Scarabs that are loot multipliers, um, which is the Shaper Scarabs, the Elder Scarabs, the Cartographer Scarabs, the Divination, the Divination Scarabs, and maybe one or two more that I'm not thinking of, I think these should go Legacy. Um, but I think that the other Scarabs should remain in the game to see how they go. Um, they do have drawbacks in that trading for them is a pain in the ass, and also the fact that trading for them is such a nuisance then ends up creating a situation where players like the, the various bots that are involved in trading in the game. I think it's really bad for the game if there's an enthusiastic support amongst sections of the player base for these, um, for these bots, you know, basically cheat programs playing, that are playing the game. Anyways, that's Scarabs. The main thing that I think needs to be talked about about this league is the Betrayal-specific content, and I want to start with the Safe Houses. The Safe Houses have a solid germ of an idea at their core, but absolutely and utterly awful, awful execution of that idea. This, the Safe Houses, with the way that they're currently set up, incentivize running trivial content for multiple reasons. And I'll just bring up my... Um, Bring up my mastermind diagram at the moment and you'll see here that you know I've got a, a semi-developed um, semi-developed grid not not particularly perfect or anything close to it but the this content incentivizes running trivial content in multiple ways I'm going to assume for the purposes of making this argument that the character that we're talking about is shaper capable and finds level 75 and lower content trivial, but does not find uh, things like, you know, six mod rare red maps to be trivial. Finds those to be engaging. Now, if you're running uh, trivial content, so level 60 to 75 zones, 
whenever you get into an encounter with the Syndicate, you will catch them all. You will not be in any danger from the Syndicate members. No Syndicate member will escape. You will not fail encounters for, due to things like the uh, timers in research labs, transportation, or uh, dying in the intervention encounters. You'll catch them all. And catching all of the members is super important because if you've got four of them, you can usually execute three of them, ranking them up. So for instance, if I had um, It That Fled, Riker, Rin, and Jorgen appear in a map, I would then be in a position where I could um, I could level up It That Fled to three, I could then level up Rin to, to three, I could level up Jorgen to three, and then I could arrest Riker, which would then put um, one of It That Fled and Thane Jorgen into uh, the head of research. On the flip side, if I only caught two of them, uh, I would have only the ability to execute one of them. So I could only rank up one of the Syndicate members. And I'd just have a lot a lot less of an ability to to gain um, friendships and anonymities that cause more of them to spawn in the future. So if you go to a content that you find engaging and for our hypothetical character that's shaper ready but that finds find six mod red maps to be fairly challenging, um, you'll make a lot less progress running running against the Syndicate in red maps. Syndicate encounters take longer. Uh, you are more likely to die to the intervention encounters, or if you survive them, you might... If you're in hardcore, you might um, log out upon realizing, oh hell, I've got three from intervention, they're tough, I'm just not ready to take this on these map mods, I'm going to... Uh, log out and I'm going to walk away from the map entirely. That's going to happen sometimes as well, especially with the uh, various Syndicate item upgrades. Uh, like you'll see here, It That Fled has the Rifkin's Dance upgrade and the Mokunuma's Conjuring upgrade. All of these things uh, make the bosses even more dangerous, as, do, uh, as does the ranks. So rank 2 is a little bit dangerous, rank 3 is a lot more dangerous. And these effects are much more noticeable in level 81 to 83 zones. Syndicate members will flee. Once you kill the first Syndicate member, the one that started the encounter, the rest of them will try to scatter. At this point, uh, if you fail to burst them down, they will teleport away. And even once you beat the encounter, you'll still have to deal with trash which will take longer and longer and longer the higher the tier of the zone. All of the meaningful Syndicate encounter awards do not scale with zone mods from maps, and so you'll wind up in a situation where your progress at leveling up the Syndicate and manipulating people into the positions you want them is tremendously slowed by the fact that you're running higher tier maps. So if we assume that getting to the Syndicate encounter takes 100% more time in a high level zone compared to a low level zone, you then have a 15% uh, loss of syndicate members to them fleeing and a 5% encounter failure rate. This all uh, stacks multiplicatively to give you 2.5 times as much progress in low tier zones as you'd get in high tier zones. And I also think that 100% more time to complete the encounter is an underestimate when there are zones like the foothills, the ossuary and the harbour bridge that have predictable layouts and where players can gear solely around move speed, which is something that's a lot harder to do in higher tier red maps. I want to contrast this system of um, you know, your relationships and your syndicate leveling to the most fundamental re reward mechanic in the game, experience. XP is a well-designed system that has harsh penalties built in for running trivial content. My current character in this league is level 93, mostly because I just simply can't be bothered uh, grinding out level 100 or even 95. And um, if I was to run a tier 1 map, I would get almost no XP for it. So there's, basically, my character has completely outgrown tier 1 maps, and I'm heavily punished if I return to them. However, the Syndicate has the opposite philosophy, where you're actually penalised for running the higher tier content and pushed back into the lower tier content. Now, remember that loot is more important in character progression than experience is once you're at high level, 
and in addition to the, to the betrayal content, uh, the best source of XP, sorry, the best source of loot being grinding low tier syndicate content, the best source of XP is also to abuse low level farming in order to acquire the purified breach stones. And this makes low level farming a strictly dominating strategy. It's strictly dominant over natural play of running you know, maps that your character finds challenging. And this leads to one of two possibilities. Either once you're once sorry, once you've established that it's strictly dominant to do low level farming, it leads to one of two possibilities. Either the betrayal rewards are met and people ignore them, uh, like the mastermind encounter, or you wind up with a move speed meta, which is what we have. Now, I'm not going to try to suggest proposals to fix uh, in-depth proposals to fix this problem, other than to say that I think tier three upgrades to syndicate member rank. So, for instance, um, executing it that Flared would take him from tier two to tier three. Um, I think that these upgrades should not be available outside maps. I also think that they should be more common. Uh, that the ability to execute, the option to execute, should be more common in higher tier maps. However, I want to also look at the mastermind situation. Now, uh, spoiler warning, if you do not know who the mastermind is, press that mute button now. I'm going to spoil it in three, two, one. Severus Snape kills Dumbledore in episode six. Oh wait, sorry, that was the wrong spoiler. Uh, Katarina is the mastermind. Now, the opportunity cost of completely scrambling your board and burning all your safe houses is far too high for the rewards of the Katarina fight. Probably would not be worth it, even if the reward was to include two Exalted Orbs as a guaranteed drop. Uh, that's because so much effort goes into building up a board that can then be quickly rebuilt after you run each safe house. So as it is, ignoring the Mastermind is a strictly dominant strategy. This is a real problem because the Mastermind fight is kind of cool. Also, the Mastermind encounter compounds all of the issues that the safe houses have with difficulty. The Mastermind fight is not trivial, and it will usually be at the tier of the highest map that gave you any safe house intelligence towards it. So for instance, if you are mostly running tier 7 maps, but at one point in your character's um, career you ran a tier 16, your next, um, your next Mastermind will actually be very close to monster level 83, it may even be monster level 83. This renders the fight too hard for players that aren't min-maxers, that are only just able to beat, say you're only just able to beat the Shaper Guardians, um, but you're sort of just running whatever maps you've got, then suddenly you go into the Katarina fight and boom, she just annihilates you. You need to be miles ahead of the prerequisite content in order to enjoy the Katarina fight. So this means that if you want to run the Katarina fight for whatever reason, maybe you find it fun, maybe you want the unique rewards, maybe you want to complete the uh, challenges related to it, you are strongly incentivized to firstly scramble your betrayal board by attempting her at, at a high monster level, then grind Harbour Bridge and only Harbour Bridge until you hate life and hate the game, um, because this will guarantee that you get a very low monster level Katarina when you next fight her. And unlike the previous safe house rewards, you will be punished severely in the, with this strategy, from, the, from this strategy, if you take a break from doing it to run even one high tier map. So, you know, if you're running lots and lots of level 60 zones, and then boom, you throw in one uh, level eight, level 77 zone, uh, I'd, I don't know the exact formula, but I believe you would be looking at then encountering Katarina at about level 74 or so, which is miles harder than copying her at level 68, the minimum level that she can, she can spawn at. So yeah, I think the Mastermind encounter has a lot of problems with it. Uh, it's partly it is that the, the loot is less than the opportunity cost of acquiring it. And secondly, it's that the fight is, unless you min-max the monster level to make it low, the fight is too hard for players except for the very, very strongest players.
Next point that I want to talk about is the purified breach stones. Um, now you'll notice uh, here that I've got it in an in an absolute ripoff tab because I think and I hope that these go legacy and then at some point in the future someone will probably message me in the standard league wanting them. Uh, so that's why I've got them in a three exalt tab at the moment. Um, these have a lot of problems with them. They were a really interesting idea. The thing is that in practice because the Breachstone realms themselves are so predictable in what you encounter in them, they're functionally, they are XP tokens that can be traded to other players. Um, once you get to the point, which players got to the point within a couple of days of the league, that at least a few of the best players on the server could uh, convincingly beat them every time. Now, the difference though between these and are just a hypothetical XP token that grants you, you know, that grants you say um, 16 million XP in a consumable item is that these can be used on six players. The reward as such is six times as high if you use your purified breach stones in a rotation. Rotations could be a positive community experience if they felt optional and if GGG's policy on scam, uh, policies on scamming around them made sense. Uh, GGG could take, a, say, a Wild West or EVE Online style approach of allowing both scams and also allowing out callers, uh, allowing callouts of scammers, whether these callouts are made in good faith or in bad faith. So, for instance, um, my character in this league is Kitten in a Trap. Um, I would support a situation where if I scammed you, you could say in global chat, Kitten in a Trap was a scammer, beware, beware, do not play with this player. But also, even if I didn't scam you and you just wanted to be, a, a, you just wanted to um, mess with my reputation, you could make a bad faith call out and just assert that I'd scammed you. Um, that's the Eve Online approach to scamming, and I think it works quite well in that game. And it would be better than the status quo here. Or you could have a hardline um, anti-scammer stance like uh, early World of Warcraft had. I, I don't know what World of Warcraft does now where you'll be punished if you don't act with integrity approach both to uh, scams and to callouts. So for instance, if, um, if I scam you, if I say to you, hey, I'm going to run this Zoss Pure Breach Stone, we're going to split the costs, we negotiate, you agree that you're going to pay 20 Chaos Orbs for, for your entry fee in, and then I take your 20 Chaos and run. Uh, if, I could be, if I could be punished for doing that, then that would be fine. Likewise, under that sort of structure, if you called, accused me publicly of being a scammer when it wasn't true, then I should be able to report you for it. So in one of those two approaches, I think um, rotations could be a positive environment because the bad actors would not be rewarded. But at the moment, uh, the way that GGG seem to handle scamming is that making any sort of call out, whether it's in good faith or bad faith, is not tolerated by the uh, GMs but the actual act of scamming is. This creates an environment where uh, bad faith actors, so the actual people running rotation scams, can get away with basically just over and over and over again repeating the same scam. This, because it is so uh, lucrative to run these scams, they get run more and more as people start saying to their friends, hey, check this out, the easiest way to make five exalts five exalts an hour is just to want to offer these breach stone runs and then not actually run your breach stone just take everyone's money and then run so i think yeah at the moment scamming rotations is a strictly dominant strategy and that's a problem and that sours the entire experience of running rotations in my opinion so that's one of the problems with pure breach stones a second one is that they drop too many maps, flooding the economy and reducing the value of maps that players earn through normal gameplay through engaging with the Atlas of Worlds. This wouldn't be a problem if other options in the Syndicate competed with it that fled in research, but because the Breach Stones have so much XP uh, and there is an insatiable demand for XP, um, nothing can compete with it that fled in research. And so as a result, pretty much everyone that is grinding the safe house rewards is grinding lots and lots and lots of 
it that fled in research. These peel breech stones are too good at, in their current incarnation, but actually I'd like to see them get another chance with the XP bonuses for the zones completely removed. So this would allow players to run higher tier versions of the breach of the breach lord domains if and only if they're actually interested in running that content. They'd feel like unique maps then in the way that uh, the, uh, for instance, the Twilight Temple unique map on the Atlas. Uh, where is it? I think it's um, here. This map it has a it has a standard, a non-standard drop pool. It's a cool little encounter. Uh, it's tier 9, players can run it if they find it fun, uh, if you don't find it fun you might, well you probably just do it once for the Atlas. That would be a much more satisfying version of the purified breach stones than what exists at the moment where essentially they just give so much XP that they can't be ignored. I do not want to see these gated behind the same sort of uh, randomness as Verician Researcher's uh, ability to turn sockets white, to bleach sockets on items is. I do not want to see a situation where the balance strategy is making it so that tier 3 it that fled has a 1 in 3 chance to upgrade a breach stone to charged, 1 in 3 to upgrade it to pure, and 1 in 3 to upgrade it to enriched. Um, I would much rather see these lose their XP bonus so that they just become a balanced part of the game. The Purified Breach Stones have been such an incredible impact on the XP economy of the game that this league now has almost as many level 100 characters as the permanent standard league. So standard is where per all, of the, all of the characters from the history of the game before the Betrayal League launched, all of them are either in standard or permanent hardcore. There were about 6,100 of them that had achieved level 100. As of the weekend just past, the weekend of uh, the second weekend in February, the Betrayal League had about 5,200 level 100 characters in it. So it gives you a sense of just how explosive the XP injection is from these um, breach stones, and why I don't think they should um, continue in their current form into in the future of the game. Last point that I want to make is now moves away from directly talking about betrayal content but it raises the question of we just look for the um the scarabs that have arrived uh the the sulfite scarabs and the delve sulfite economy of this um of this league there's been a lot of complaints about this and i actually think it's better than people make it out to be the but it also does have some real problems. Sulfite is tremendously valuable to players that have a well-established mine. So if you've gotten your delves down to the five six hundreds, then you will get so many rewards from using a Gilded Sulfite Scarab to gain... You know, I think these give you approximately 13,000 um, Sulfite that you're quite happy to pay 30 or even even 40 or 50, 60 Chaos Orbs potentially. I think you would still be happy to buy these at 60 Chaos Orbs in that case. Um, however, for players that don't have an established mine, the sulfite, um, sulf uh, rewards that you get per sulfite spend are much lower. And so this creates an awkward situation where the players that have an established, uh, have a very established delve mine, end up um, being in a position where they have the resources to purchase all the additional sulfide that they want. Whereas players that are just fighting through the early and middle stages of, their, of establishing their mine um, find that they just do not have enough sulfide to do it unless they're playing every day. If you're logging in every day, yeah, you'll get enough sulfite to um, to get pretty deep in the mines. Um, I think, though, that there's a really unhealthy feedback loop between the sulfite economy and mapping at the moment. When you are not yet advanced in your, in your delve mines, so let's say that you're currently at uh, monster level 72 delves, and you are currently um, fighting your way through, say, tier 10 maps. At this point, you're getting very, very, very little sulfite, and 
you're going to be struggling really badly to establish yourself with a map pool. The delve mines aren't helping you because you can't get to the bigger sources of sulfite that appear later in the um, that appear later in the atlas. For instance, you don't have one of the best tools for um, one of the best tools for the acquisition of sulfite, which is the Zana Elder mod. You'll notice that Academy is where my daily Nico is on on the Atlas at the moment. Uh, if I just stick a rare rare twenty quality Academy in the in the um, map device and then throw fifteen chaos at this option. Um, I will then get a tier, all of the benefits of a tier 16 uh, Nico, which can be quite consider can be an enormous amount of sulfite that will then cause my map pool to explode even further because I can spend that in the in the delve mines, uh, which have an enormous amount of maps dropping in them. So for for a person that just wants to casually experience the delve content, they will get enough sulfite from the dailies, but for anyone looking to make a serious push. You need to amass a lot of those gilded sulfites, or of the sulfite scarabs in general, it doesn't need to be gilded tier, in order to do so. And I think this isn't a particularly satisfying game, uh, gameplay mechanic, because it means that until you fight your way through to about tier 400 of, of the Delve Mine, level 400 of the Delve Mines, you're needing to keep sinking more and more and more currency into getting your delve mines deeper and this ends up just being quite a um yeah generally quite an unsatisfying combination i just um should have been putting on do not disturb but i haven't done so so i'll honor this trade for this guy it's also really clunky to trade sulfite with other players compared to trading for other um other sorts of loot other sorts of content that is uh, loot gated, like Uberatsuri or Tier 16 maps, or the Eternal Labyrinth. In those cases, the trade is easily ma uh, is easily managed, but it's quite tricky at the um, it's quite tricky when you get to the um, when you get to trying to trade to acquire more and more sulfite. Delve's native scaling also, I think, is broken, and it's worse than it was in the previous league. Um, I think that the monster damage needs to scale more slowly, and monster hit points faster, are uh, explosively fast even, so that players have more potential to push deeper before they run into uh, the one-shot mechanics. I think that the ideal experience where you realise you can't progress any further is where you can't kill, fast, kill monsters fast enough to maintain control of encounters. Monsters are spawning faster than you can kill them. I don't think the ideal failure uh, feeling of, oh hell, I'm going to fail this encounter, comes when you end up playing Rocket Tag, where monsters monsters are one-shot killing you, you're one-shot killing them, or one or two-shot killing them. But once you get deep in the mines, uh, that's the experience at the moment, that basically monsters are hitting for 25, 30,000 damage, and they're still dying in a reasonable time frame. So I think there's a fair bit, fair bit that needs to be fixed in delving, um, and I think the experience of the experience that you that you encounter early in the league um, could be better, but I don't have any concrete suggestions on how to do that. Ultimately, though, I think delve has been introduced pretty well into the core game in a way that incursion needs a bit more work. However, uh, just to summarize the status of the betrayal specific content, um, I'm calling this an autopsy because this league is pretty much dead to me now. Um, it's got all of the problems Dark Shrine League had with, with some charms, but also with, yeah, with basically um, all those problems are back where the league gets solved, the question of how do you optimize the league mechanics is completely solved and then becomes no no longer remains fun to engage with once it's solved. I don't think it's ready to go core as it currently is, 
Uh, I think the challenges in this league are fine. I think the Atlas overhaul was fine. Um, I think Scarabs have some problems with them. But the safe houses and the mastermind, everything to do with the loot structure in those encounters needs a lot more work. And I'm going to leave it there. So thanks for your time. And hopefully I'll see, well, other than popping in to get my 36 challenges and maybe to join in one or two of the um, race events that are happening in the interim, um, I will see you for whatever the next league ends up being.